Excellencies, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, dear colleagues, I am uh, very happy to open today's webinar on UN Security Council in times of uh, great power rivalry. How can small states make a difference? Uh, this event is uh, organized by the Estonian Foreign Policy Institute at the International Center for Defense and Security in Tallinn in cooperation with the Norwegian Institute of uh, International Affairs, NUPI. And it is uh, part of our joint research project of uh, FP and NUPI, which uh, looks at uh, Estonian-Norwegian cooperation in the United Nations and its uh, Security Council and uh, asks how to defend and uh, renew multilateralism. And the project is uh, supported by the EEA and uh, Norway grants. A big thank you to, to our partners and uh, supporters. My name is uh, Kristi Reik. I am the director of the Estonian Foreign Policy Institute at uh, ICDS. And I really look forward to moderating today's uh, discussion uh, with a really great, uh, impressive lineup of uh, speakers whom I will uh, introduce in a moment. As I said, uh, the event is part of a research project. Uh, we uh, introduced it uh, or initiated it uh, with the Norwegian colleagues, uh, Kristin Haugevik and Nils uh, Skia of Nupi about uh, one year ago, when it was uh, not yet uh, known if Norway would be elected as a non-permanent uh, member uh, together with Estonia for this year. Uh, Estonia, as you may know, is uh, currently in the Security Council as a non-permanent member for the first time ever for the period of uh, 2020 to 2021. And then we were very happy when the decision uh, came in June last year that uh, Norway was uh, also elected. Uh, for the period uh, 2021 to 22. So, and, and of course, uh, we know no, for Norway, it was not uh, the first time. Norway has a very impressive uh, experience of promoting peace and security in the UN framework. And we are very happy now that uh, this year we have uh, Estonia and Norway together uh, in the Security Council as uh, close partners and uh, like minded countries. And I really look forward to, to hearing from the ambassadors, UN ambassadors of both countries about uh, the experiences and, and plans uh, about the priorities and also about the cooperation. Uh, but now looking uh, a little bit at the broader context, um, multilateralism and a rules-based uh, international order where states cooperate and they find solutions uh, through cooperation to problems and conflicts is of course something hugely important for small states. But as we know, uh, the past few years have been uh, quite tough times for multilateralism. Uh, we had a period of uh, US disengagement uh, from the UN during the presidency of Donald Trump uh, now, with the new U.S. administration, uh, uh, we have the message from, from the U.S. that multilateralism is back, and the U.S. is back at uh, multilateral tables. This is great news. However, uh, we can see it in, in daily news that uh, competition and tensions between the U.S. and uh, major authoritarian powers, China and Russia, are becoming uh, even more visible, and of course, this is also affecting Europe, and it is undermining the global rules-based order. We see the Western uh, understanding of international norms, including human rights and democracy, but also security norms, uh, just look at Crimea or South China Sea, uh, being challenged by non-Western powers in an increasingly assertive uh, manner. So we also want to look today at the dynamics of great power rivalry in the UN Security Council and ask how does that influence the opportunities of non-permanent members, small states, uh, to make a difference. 
and what new developments can already be observed or what can be expected uh, during the new administration of uh, the US. In general, it is uh, always more difficult for the non-permanent uh, members uh, to have an impact on, on uh, Security Council work in comparison to the five permanent members. Many issues on the agenda are predetermined by earlier decisions. In addition, there are, of course, events on the ground uh, that uh, require the Security Council to react. The events can also be opportunities for, for small states to be active. For example, Estonia has been active in bringing the situation in Belarus to the Security Council uh, attention. Uh, one more interesting topic uh, concerns the working methods of uh, Security Council, which have uh, changed over time. And the latest uh, changes have been forced upon us uh, by the pandemic. And we all miss uh, a lot physical contacts, but again, there are also opportunities uh, involved and the virtual habits have uh, provided uh, new possibilities and new working methods, which uh, I also uh, hope we will hear about a little bit today. And by the way, the event today uh, would have been unlikely to happen quite like this, uh, unless uh, we had this new habits of uh, working uh, virtually. Uh, now let me introduce uh, the speakers. Uh, as I said, they are all leading experts uh, of the topic, uh, together combining long-time diplomatic experience uh, with analytical and academic uh, depth. So um, a warm welcome, first of all, to uh, Ambassador Sven Jürgensen, uh, permanent representative of Estonia to the United Nations. He has been in this post uh, since uh, 2015 and also held uh, the same position from 1998 uh, to 2000. In addition, uh, he has served as ambassador to the United States and to France, among other uh, positions during a 30 years uh, career in the Estonian foreign ministry. Uh, then ambassador Mona Jol, permanent representative of uh, Norway, to the United Nations since 2018, has an even longer experience uh, as a diplomat, uh, has uh, worked with the Norwegian MFA since uh, 1986, and has a very broad uh, diplomatic experience, including positions uh, uh, of ambassador uh, to the United Kingdom and director general for security policy and the high north in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And uh, then I am very happy to have with us uh, Richard Bowen, who is uh, currently UN Director at uh, the International Crisis Group, and I'm sure a um, well-known expert to anyone who has uh, followed uh, UN Affairs. He has previously worked with the European Council on Foreign Relations and uh, New York University Center on International Cooperation, as well as the Foreign Policy Center in uh, London. And by the way, I recommend anyone who is interested in, in UN affairs to follow Richard's uh, Twitter account that sheds light on the, on the UN affairs in a knowledgeable but also humorous uh, way. And last but not least, uh, I'm very happy to welcome Dr. Ulrika Müller, who is an uh, assistant professor at uh, the political science department of the University of Gothenburg, where she is also director of uh, studies of two major educational programs at master's and undergraduate level. And she has a broad range of uh, research uh, interests in, in the fields of international politics and foreign policy analysis, including uh, states' uh, aspirations in the UN uh, Security Council. So uh, a big welcome to all the speakers. And uh, I will now uh, give the word to Ambassador Sven Jürgensen uh, for your introductory speech, please. Thank you, Christy. Thank you for organizing it and, and thank you for having us. Uh, it's, it's an in interesting subject in itself, but also it's, it's mostly also so interesting for us being there for the first time in the council and, and being there a little more than a year now looking back and trying to analyze ourselves actually how things are going and what we have achieved 
and what lies ahead. Uh, looking at the, the, the role of the small countries between big powers, uh, I would divide this actually into, into three different uh, uh, packages uh, that I, I will talk about. The first one, the small countries themselves, how they can work in the council, uh, what is their role? Secondly, exactly the, the subject, uh, how can we, we help along with, with the big, big power rivalry? And third, you mentioned also the change in the American administration, how this looks like from inside the council. Well, the first uh, uh, group of, of issues that I mentioned, you know, the, I think in, in all small countries before joining, there is a, a debate about whether it's worthwhile. What can the small countries do? Uh, because the P5 is, to, is, you know, running the show and so on. And this, and secondly, uh, we have enough information. We are a small country. We don't have enough embassies. We don't know what's happening in Africa and so on. And, and thirdly, uh, are there any really subjects that are interesting to our people that they understand what we are doing? Uh, a good example is, you know, Lithuania, when they were in, they, they were... They, they were doing a marvelous job, but everybody is saying, yeah, but it's, uh, that's exactly when Ukraine happened. And so they were, they were lucky to have a subject on the table that is close to their hearts. Uh, but going through the, these three, you know, first one, what I, I was a little bit even surprised, I would say, that there is much more of work on 15 than 5 plus 10 than I expected. Most of the subjects actually are, are discussed as between equals, even though the five, of course, have a longer experience, they have a veto right and so on. But I don't feel this, this difference so much. By the way, I would also like to say that when you, you were talking about non-permanent members, we prefer to talk about elected members, because that means that we have legitimacy, we are elected, we are democratically elected, they are not. So this is our privilege. Uh, then the information part also is not that hard because uh, the experts uh, learn really quickly and, and uh, it's not that, that we need to have an embassy in Sudan in, in order to, to be able to speak about Sudan because the information needed for this kind of debate is readily available. And, and so we have a very good team and I, I'm really impressed with them, how, how fast actually they have become really good good uh, experts. And the third, you know, that there are subjects that are interesting to our people. What we have discovered, uh, like you said, I have been there for 30 years, things are always happening. And there are always also happening things that are close to our heart. Uh, when we have been there for a little more than one year, you know, you have seen developments in Belarus, you have seen Nagorno-Karabakh, so issues that we, if we wouldn't be there, would not come to the table so strongly. So, so I think, all of those three doubts that were in the in the society actually have gotten a positive response. The role of small states depends very much also on their ambition. And uh, we have decided that when it's only for two years and, uh, and it's once in a generation, then let's be as ambitious as possible. Let's be as active as possible. And, and if you look at the, the, uh, the subjects taken uh, to the table or the, the unofficial events organized and meetings, then we have been the most active member of the council. And uh, you, you can also compare the presidencies of P5 and, and uh, E10. And E10 presidencies usually seem to be more ambitious and there are more events because exactly for the fact that they, they only have once or some have twice the opportunity to, to put their priorities on the table. So, and the priorities are also important, you know, you, you have to first very strongly fix your priorities and then stick to them. And the priorities that Estonia had uh, getting into the council were international law and rules-based world order. As you mentioned, Christy, these are really important for small states. And our former president, Lennart Meri, even once said that, that international law is the nuclear weapon of small states. And from the deterrence point of view, I believe he, he, he was right. Then it was new threats uh, like environment, climate, uh, then cybersecurity. That is a, an important subject for Estonia and where we have been extremely, extremely active. And, third, uh, and then fourth and, and last is, is working methods, because Estonia is a, is a member of a group here in New York that is called the ACT Group, Accountability, Coherence, Transparency. 
and that is work, uh, working on, on making the, 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 the work of the Security Council more efficient, more transparent. And so we are vice chairs of the, of the subsidiary body also, of the working group on working methods. And then, like I mentioned, our own subjects that we have been able to put on the table and uh, that otherwise probably wouldn't have been there so strongly that Ukraine, we have twice already had an ARIA format meeting on Crimea, then we've had several events on, on Belarus, uh, cybersecurity, uh, children uh, that are a big, uh, important subject for Estonia. Uh, to talk about ambition then, what we tried to do was to be as, as ambitious as possible, but understanding our own capabilities and having, uh, having a responsible approach. And by the beginning of this year, we already understood that we do have a capability of doing more. And so we were working towards having also what is called here in New York, a pen holdership. That means there are countries that are responsible for certain, uh, certain portfolios. And we, were, we are now together with Norway, we are holding the pen for Afghanistan. That is a major portfolio. And then with France on the EU mission uh, to enforce the arms embargo in Libya called Irini. Now, pen holderships and subsidiary bodies are two interesting animals because it used to be that pen holderships were pretty much a prerogative for the P5 and they, they grab the pen, even though pen holdership officially doesn't exist. Everybody can grab a pen, but others have to accept it. So therefore, uh, working towards getting a pen holdership in this kind of uh, big portfolio, an important and complicated portfolio like Afghanistan, it took quite a lot of work for the with the P5 slowly starting behind the doors, you know, talking it through so that the, we would be accepted as as holding the pen. Uh, then, but the, the but as a contrary to that, uh, the the subsidiary body chairing like the sanctions committees and so on, they are all of them are held by by elected members. And there is even a joke that probably the, 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 the P5 are thinking that they will drown us with the work that they don't uh, consider very important. But, but there is also a major development. And, and unfortunately, last year it was broken. It, was, it used to be that the P5 just handed their own decision who is chairing which committee without any right to, to, to say anything for the, P, the E10, that you take this committee, you take that committee. By the time that we were there, actually, it was the, the incoming five members who decided among themselves who was taking which pen. But last year it was broken because India had a strong ambition of taking something that China didn't like. And so I hope that this will be just a, 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 uh, a short uh, distraction from, the, from the, the, the positive development that we've had. Now, maybe I will... I don't have too much time left. Maybe I will, I will say a few words also uh, coming from the level of our ambition uh, about our next presidency that will be in June. And um, like mentioning our interests and, and uh, our profile in the council, one thing that we tried to do is uh, even though last year we had presidency in May and this year in June, and May and June are the busiest months in the council. And like you said, Christy, a lot of the, the, the agenda is filled automatically by regular events. And so there is not too much uh, of a possibility to introduce your own subjects. But we are trying to do still uh, to find slots for our interests. And one of them is cybersecurity. We are planning to, to have the first time cybersecurity officially in the, in the Security Council agenda in the form of open debate and, and hopefully even getting a, a, a product, that means a presidential statement. And, and hopefully by the time that we leave, one of the things we leave behind would be that cybersecurity will be, it will be part of mainstream uh, Security Council work. Uh, then there's children and armed conflict where we are planning to have an event, then uh, UN-EU uh, cooperation, uh, that is also as a member of European Union trying to keep this high on the agenda and then to have another uh, uh, open debate on working methods as, go, uh, as vice chair of the, of the committee. Now quickly uh, also uh, on US, you are right, US, the last year, the first year in the council, it was quite visible that the US was, was invisible and US had gone and this fortunately has now changed. Uh, and uh, 
we all saw the messages that U.S. is back, multilateralism is back, and 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 diplomacy is back, uh, and it's already visible also in the council. Uh, be it in uh, the the question of women's rights, uh, like sexual and reproductive health rights, climate, uh, Iran, JCPOA, uh, United States has sent already in the letter that they call back the letter to for snapback. But this is a very difficult thing to change. You know, we. United States has, has done a, a, a little, a, a couple of small steps, but but um, Iran has not responded yet, and everybody's waiting for big steps. But I, I I think both of them have political realities, and big steps are not impossible. So it's it's hard to see what's happening. But I think a good example of of things changing was that when we tried to adopt a resolution last year on COVID, then it took three and a half months because of the battle between China and United States. And finally, we, we started mid-March, and finally we only managed to adopt it early, early May, uh, no, no, early July. Then this year, uh, we adopted a product in two weeks. So the United States is, is back and it's visible, and, and it's, it's really a good, good uh, uh, news for us. Uh, partly also a, a role of small states, you know, when there was a, a, this deadlock on, on COVID resolution last year, then on our initiative, we uh, just to push the, the the subject a little bit. We introduced a, a compromise resolution together with Germany. It didn't pass, and there were even some angry feelings because there is a very strong feeling of ownership in the council. But I'm sure that it helped along finally to get to the result. And uh, and so finally, the last thing to say maybe is that the 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 experience we've had has been so positive that we have decided already that that we had an analysis that probably for a, a country or the size of Estonia, we should be there perhaps every 30 years or so. And so we have already introduced our candidature for 2050. So thank you very much. Thanks a lot, uh, Sven. And uh, indeed, it has been uh, uh, very interesting to follow and see how active Estonia has been uh, as an elected member, as, as you say, in the Security Council. Um, and I remember also the discussions uh, beforehand about whether it is worthwhile and whether it is the best uh, way to use the, the scarce uh, diplomatic and other resources of a small state such as Estonia. Uh, and, and I would like to come back to a number of issues that you raised. But uh, first, uh, I will now give the floor to, to uh, the Norwegian uh, UN Ambassador Mona Juul, please. Thank you so much, uh, Kirsti, and um, and thanks to uh, very much to uh, to Sven as well, because I think he he has already touched on on uh, on, on many issues that uh, that that I will uh, will, will uh, talk about as well. And as I said before, we 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 opened up. Uh, it's uh, we 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 are very like-minded with Estonia, uh, and I also would like to echo what you said. Uh, Kirsty, and that we are really very impressed by uh, by by Estonia and uh, and what we uh, see from uh, from uh, the performance of Estonia in the council is really very very impressive. So we are we feel privileged uh, being able to uh, and, and to work together. I will I'll try to uh, to answer or structure what I'm going to say but with the question that you have put in the uh, in the background paper both on our experiences as uh, as uh, as elected uh, member and what the small states can do to promote uh, uh, priorities uh, alongside major powers and a little bit about the new dynamics in the in the security council so just let me uh, let me start by uh, by by our experience um, uh, as uh, as an elected member uh, so far uh, by by saying that uh, the support also from our Nordic and Baltic friends has been of critical important importance both during our campaign uh, and also in the first months as a Security uh, Council member. So drawing on the experience and expertise of both Sweden and Estonia has also been instrumental for us when we were preparing uh, for our own membership, uh, both on, uh, on all the organizational matters uh, and as well as on the different uh, files. 
we should also not forget that this is actually the first time that two Nordic Baltic countries are represented in the Security Council simultaneously, which gives us a great platform for cooperation. So also very happy for the cooperation between our, uh, our, our research uh, institutes. Um, so it also lends us a good opportunity to uphold the momentum Momentum, momentum on certain dossiers also after, after uh, the two years that we uh, that we serve. So uh, I would also like to say that uh, despite the global tensions that we uh, that we experience uh, every day, uh, much of the day to day work in in the council remains constructive like also sven referred to that uh, that it is possible to really to have good discussion uh, with all members of the uh, uh, of the council and that there is for practical purposes not much of a difference between the uh, the p5s and the uh, and the e10 in our first three months, we have experienced that through careful and sometimes a little bit of creative diplomacy, it is possible to achieve a consensus on, on actually on most issues. Uh, so when, when on the question of how small states can, uh, can promote their priorities uh, alongside the major power, let me start by sharing an example. Together with Estonia, as we uh, as Sven talked about, we act as a pen holder on the Council's work on Afghanistan. Earlier this month, we managed to unite the Council behind a very clear condemnation of targeting killings in Afghanistan. Uh, elected members do have an important role to play in order to move certain files and dossiers like this. And it illustrates that when we work together, coordinated action, it can actually prove results, even on topic like this uh, obviously is and was, um, we, we were able to, uh, to, to reach consensus in, in the council. Um, so when it's relevant, Norway seeks to incorporate and strengthening text concerning our priorities in the council statements and resolution. Our approach is targeting, and ultimately, our aim is to bring about a real change on the ground. And of course, the level of acceptance and pushback we experience varies from topic to topic. Certainly, for instance, women, peace and security and climate change and, um, and security, which are on uh, one of our, our main priorities or two of our main priorities, there are of course challenges uh, uh, to, uh, to, to promote those, uh, those uh, two, uh, two issues. But I think our experience so far, which is just uh, two and a half months, has been that it has, it's actually easier um, to promote these issues um, uh, when you place them in a country or a regional specific context. Um, and that we then need to underpin them with sort of hard evidence such as scientific research and, and NGO uh, testimonials and supported by presentants, including previous council documents and statements. Um, we, we joined the council, uh, I think with high but realistic ambition, including, as I said, on climate and security. So uh, when we're sweeping changes in unlikely in the short term, and we realize that, I think we should strive for in incremental steps. And I think we have managed to do that. And for example, when the council now negotiated the extension of the mandate of, of emphasis in January, uh, Norway suggested adding a reference to, to climate change, which we managed to, to, to get uh, in. This is, of course, I mean, a small, uh, small uh, amendment in an otherwise comprehensive resolution text, but, but ultimately it means that the Council recognizes that climate change should be a part of the, of the dialogue between, our, our, between the parties. It also represents progress in that it moved the climate change and security discourse out of the African context, where it's most most time it, we, we end up discussing it and which is, uh, which is also uh, a, a, good, a good trend. 
So um, also on the resolution 2565 on the COVID uh, vaccine distribution in conflict areas, there we also, I think another very good example, how we sort of both by initiating, but not least through concerted action, managed to adopt very important uh, language. In, in this resolution, we managed to strengthen the language on international human rights law and international humanitarian law and other priorities from our work in the Council. And the adopted resolution particularly calls for protection, safety and security of humanitarian and medical personnel engaged in medical duties, including vaccination work. And these are extremely important uh, aspects and, and among our, our uh, main priorities on the protection uh, of civilian uh, agenda. So obviously, uh, we think that the E10 is a force of power in the Council when we, when we stick or band together and reinforce each other's effort. And uh, it makes it more costly for individual veto powers to pull the brakes on initiatives that have the E10 uh, uh, unity and, uh, and support. Um, uh, so um, I think the, uh, the, the, we, we will continue to, uh, to be uh, pragmatic and systematic uh, with the aim to further enhance the role of, uh, of, of the E10 and the potential unity that is uh, among there. But of course, we have also to realize that E10 consists of 10 independent countries with also different uh, size and different, um, different, different agendas, but, but we certainly see uh, a, a growing potential for, for working together as, uh, as Eaton. Also, on, not least on the working method that, uh, that Sven uh, mentioned, uh, the working method of the council. Um, so, um, um, so in the long term, uh, we should also endeavor, I think, to, uh, to, to build unity more also around the, the thematic uh, issues and on country uh, situation where the E10 is more, more, uh, more likely um, to differ, but we should at the same time try to, to enhance unity. So then, uh, lastly, let me say something about the new dynamic uh, that uh, that is to be expected in in the Security Council now with the, with the new administration. It's of course, uh, uh, I think, uh, evident for all of us that the Biden administration's firm commitment uh, to multilateralism is uh, very much welcome. Um, and we have already seen uh, their sort of re-engagement on some of the global efforts, uh, uh, for instance, on, uh, on, on climate change and, and not least on, on, on global efforts to tackle the pandemic. Um, so at, at the UN and in the Council, there is, there is a noticeable change on the American position and approaches, as, as Sven mentioned, including on sexual reproductive rights and sexual and gender-based violence. Um, moreover, it is the return uh, of US presence in all the files uh, in, uh, in the Council, uh, which is really uh, being uh, recognized that, that they are more active on, on, on all of them. Um, it is also our impression that, uh, that the American reorientation coupled with the current composition uh, of the council has translated into a more dynamic um, uh, and constructive, or a more constructive dynamic, dynamic around many of the issues that we have mentioned. But and yet I think we have to realize that, uh, that the US policy on, on also many areas still remains unformulated on many of the, of, of the core issues. And I think um, we probably need to, to wait and see a little how, how, how these things are, are going, uh, going forward. Um, yeah, because we have also seen them in uh, 
both vis-a-vis uh, -vis with Russia and vis-a-vis -vis China that there are already some kind of tension building up, uh, I mean, outside the council, but how the, this will reflect in the council, uh, that of course uh, remain uh, to be seen. Um, I, I will also say that uh, we have seen also sign uh, of cooperation and willingness uh, to, uh, to, to compromise also between the, the P5. Uh, and I think, uh, we, we, we of course, the, the ultimate example this year is uh, that we managed to come up with the, the statements, a United Statement on, on Myanmar. Um, I think that uh, initially that was uh, that was not uh, not maybe foreseen that we will be able to do so. But uh, after intense negotiations um, uh, between uh, between I would say all of us, we managed to come up even uh, twice with with a united message on, on on Myanmar, which is really something that we uh, should take notice of, and uh, and and we hope that that can continue uh, also going uh, going forward. Also, the fact that we managed to uh, to adopt a resolution uh, 2565 on COVID-19 vaccine distribution in conflict areas is also a very, very good sign. Um, it is especially a positive development given that it took, I think, three months last year when the council didn't even manage to come up with anything on, uh, on the... Uh, on, on the COVID uh, uh, situation. So, um, so far, uh, I think the, this year the Council has adopted eight resolutions. Six of them were passed unanimous, unanimously, while Russia, acting, acting alone, abstained on the remaining two. So, I mean, the vision exists, but we are able to to, to produce a, a result and come up with uh, with, with 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 products that uh, that uh, shows that uh, it is maybe a, a, a little more productive than, uh, than, uh, than than what many many things. But of course, we have uh, we have not uh, any illusion that there are challenges and difficulties uh, ahead. Um, you know, we are also, uh, as Norway, um, pen holder on, uh, on Syria, uh, the humanitarian file together with, uh, with Ireland. This is among one of the more, more contentious uh, issues with the cross-border humanitarian assistance. And, uh, and we are working very hard to, uh, to, um, to review, renew that resolution on, um, in, in, in summer, but we know that that is uh, quite, uh, quite a challenge. Um, and the same, of course, as, as we mentioned, there will have to be follow up both on Myanmar and, and on Ethiopia Tigray situation. And we certainly hope that uh, that we will be able to to uh, to, to continue to have uh, have unity uh, on, on on these issues. So. Uh, there are um, there are a lot of challenges ahead, but um, we uh, we are we like uh, like what Sven said. We are uh, we are quite ambitious, uh, but I think we are are realistic, and we certainly see that that there is a place for 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 small states, and that small states absolutely can have an an, uh, an influence in in the council. So I think I stopped there. Probably talk for too long, but. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much. And thanks for providing all these uh, concrete examples. Uh, it, I think, gave us a sense of uh, how the work is like, that you move ahead with uh, very small steps, uh, small details, but uh, you have these goals in your mind that you want to move uh, towards. And uh, you have to be patient uh, in your daily work uh, to, to move in that direction. Things don't happen very quickly. Um, at this point, I will already take one question and uh, I will uh, tell the audience that you can uh, post questions in the Q&A uh, function in, in Zoom. But there is one question that is uh, actually for the, uh, for the ambassadors of uh, both countries, uh, namely, um, 
how does uh, this position as an elected uh, member in the Security Council affect uh, security of uh, your own country and uh, regional security? Because you, come, you become more involved in uh, several global uh, conflicts. Uh, and does this mean that, uh, that the global problems uh, come more closer to you, to, to your region, or, or can you actually improve uh, the national and the regional security by being involved in the Security Council? Uh, Sven, would you take this question first? Yes, uh, thank you. This was also part of the, the pre-membership debate during the time that we were candidates in Estonia, that it might actually decrease Estonian security because maybe we are forced to take positions in conflicts and situations where otherwise we wouldn't and that would be uncomfortable. Now I would say it hasn't happened actually and, and looking at the, the kinds of conflicts that we have it's quite the opposite that we see. It's that it's a unique situation where a country like Estonia that has 1.3 million people is constantly on the radar screen, and I would say positively on the radar screen of P5 countries. Uh, it's not always that that uh, the ambassador of United States or Russia or China is, is calling the ambassador of Estonia. They need us, and that means actually that that we we are in the same league for those two years. And secondly, why it's also not true is if, if uh, what I mentioned also earlier is that there are so many opportunities actually to increase security in our region by by raising the issues that are really important to us. And, and maybe uh, the global understanding of importance of that would be smaller. I, if you look at Ukraine, for example, then it was it was a lucky coincidence that in 2014, when it all started, Lithuania was a member of the council. That made it possible to bring it very strongly into the, the, the agenda of the Security Council. Next was Ukraine, then Poland, and now Estonia. So if you look at the, the five years that have passed, or so six years, then actually the, it's, it's, a, it's like I say, in, in some way it's a lucky coincidence that we were there, but at the same time, these things all the, uh, happen all the time. So I would say that, that all those issues have been actually positive. First of all, we have been able to raise our own issues. And secondly, the, the conflicts that we are talking about, where even where there is a big power rivalry, we are, we are able to talk to everybody. And this actually does not decrease, but it increases our security. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mona. So what is your view from Norwegian perspective? I, I think it's very, very, very much the same as uh, as Sven said. I mean, we have to deal with, or we we are in in the middle of a big power rivalry. We even uh, even if we are not at the council, we have to deal with uh, with, with with all the same issues. Uh, standing sort of between the US on the one side, uh, uh, Russia, China on the other, and, and that is how we have sort of managed to uh, uh, to formulate sort of our, our, our foreign foreign policy in balancing this at the same time, having uh, always had sort of the UN as an anchor in our foreign policy also when it comes to respecting international uh, uh, laws uh, as as a sort of a, a, a ground uh, <laughs> ground stone for, uh, for 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 all what we are doing internationally especially especially as as a small uh, small power so so we don't really see that uh, that uh, much difference that the, the the difference is on the positive side like uh, like what Sven said, no, we have we have a platform to 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 speak our uh, our, <laughs> our our mind and to uh, and to to really um, pick up uh, the, uh, the the issues that are of, of, of crucial importance for him and having a platform where we can talk about it. So so I don't see that as any uh, any change in 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 our sort of uh, security uh, sort of posture, but rather rather the opposite that it's sort of if if for anything it has strengthened it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
Uh, now it is really time to move on to, to the uh, next uh, speakers. Um, and uh, the next is Richard uh, Gowen. Um, we really look forward to hearing about your view as an analyst, uh, not a diplomat, but an analyst on, on the dynamics between permanent and elected members, and also the question of the impact of the new US administration. Richard, please. Oh, well, thank you, Christy. It's a great pleasure to join everyone. Um, I think two of my final trips before COVID were to Oslo and Tallinn. And it's a pleasure to return to both cities uh, virtually and to see a lot of friends, I think, uh, amongst the attendees here. Um, I, I'm going to cover a lot of the same ground that Sven and Mona have already covered, um, but I hope I bring uh, a different perspective to it. Um, I begin by congratulating both Estonia and Norway for um, very activist, very ambitious uh, terms on the council so far. I would simply add that Estonia has one immense strength, which Sven didn't mention, which is that it is the only council member that knows how to organize an online meeting. Um, when COVID forced council business online last year, uh, the P5 and others were quite incapable of organizing a decent webinar, but Estonia showed them how to do it. Um, with some very well organized online events during your presidency in May. But um, more seriously, uh, I want to look at quickly the divisions in the Security Council, which we've already touched on, uh, the effect of the Biden administration, and then immensely briefly, uh, five areas where I think uh, Estonia and Norway, amongst other elected members, uh, can focus in the year ahead. Firstly, on the divisions in the Security Council, I fully agree with Sven and Mona that these are sometimes overestimated. It's not true to say, as many commentators do, that the Council is paralysed. The Security Council was paralysed in 1959 when it passed one single resolution in an entire year. Today, as Mona has pointed out, the Council has already passed eight resolutions um, in three months. By historical stand standards, the council remains uh, pretty active. And it is striking that despite geopolitical differences, relations amongst uh, the PRs in particular always seem to be pretty good. And there is a will to cooperate amongst senior diplomats um, in the council. Although I think that the realities of uh, COVID have maybe slightly reduced those personal linkages over the last year. Nonetheless, I don't think we should pretend that uh, P5 divisions um, are not a real problem. We have seen China and Russia over the last year grow increasingly aggressive in asserting their positions on certain issues. For example, um, the delivery of humanitarian aid to Syria. Uh, China and Russia have launched an extensive campaign against US and EU sanctions, essentially arguing that it's the US that is at fault for the crises in Venezuela and Syria because of its unilateral sanctions. And I think that we can see that Russia in particular um, is still very willing to act as a spoiler in the council, uh, even despite the change of the US administration. And so when Sven organized an ARIA formula meeting on Crimea um, a few weeks ago, uh, the Russians organized a counter um, ARIA on Crimea to sell their own version of events um, in Ukraine uh, to other council members. Uh, the, the Russians and Chinese are willing um, to pick fights and I think um, they are uh, going to remain willing to pick fights in the council going forward. The underlying tensions amongst the P5 mean that most of the time when we face a crisis like that in Myanmar or Tigray, we don't even think of passing a resolution with binding clauses um, on the actors in that crisis. We typically reach for much uh, uh, lower levels of um, product, such as presidential statements or press statements, because we know that if you really got into the business of negotiating resolutions, um, you would end up running into vetoes. And so around a lot of recent um, conflicts on the council's uh, radar, um, Nagorno-Karabakh, Ethiopia, um, Myanmar, uh, the negotiations have tended to be around um, statements and you know, although it is impressive that we have got statements on an issue like Myanmar, 
that has not affected the killing on the ground. So I do think that we're working in a very constrained environment. And I do worry that the tensions we've already seen um, between China, Russia and the Biden administration will reinforce those constraints um, over the year ahead and, and beyond. That said, turning to Biden, there clearly is a Biden effect in the Security Council. I would say that when um, Biden was coming into office, there were very high expectations for what he might do at the UN and what Linda Thomas-Greenfield, his ambassador might, might do at the UN. Uh, there was talk um, of a really big US-backed Security Council resolution on the fight against COVID, modeled on the US re resolution on Ebola back in 2014. Um, there was discussions perhaps of a US backed uh, product on climate change. The US has been a little more cautious than that. It hasn't attempted to land really um, big resolutions in its um, first few months since the transition. But it is clear that um, as the ambassadors said, uh, Linda Thomas Greenfield is focusing on crises like those in Tigray with an intensity that her predecessor uh, Kelly Craft did not. And the US has opened up space for other members of the council to be much more um, thoughtful and innovative around issues like climate change and COVID. Um, we've already mentioned how long it took to get a COVID resolution last year. It's worth mentioning that when Germany tried to table a Security Council resolution on climate change in conflict last year, the US torpedoed it point blank. By contrast, when the UK decided to organize a high level meeting on climate change and conflict last month, um, John Kerry uh, notably uh, attended the entire session and actually approached the exercise with some humility, um, noting the important work of the Europeans on climate change to date. So there's a real change of mood. What then can elected members like um, Estonia and Norway, and specifically Estonia and Norway, uh, focus on in the coming year. Um, here are five things that I would suggest, uh, most of which we've already touched on. The first is um, picking up on this opening on climate change and conflict. The UK, as I said, held a successful um, open debate on this issue last month, but it didn't result in any resolution or even a statement. I think there is a feeling that it falls now to the elected members of the council to try and pick up on the work that Germany, Germany and others did before and actually put on the table some sort of text with substantive proposals for how the UN can do more on climate and conflict. That could be the appointment of a special envoy on the issue. It could be setting up a special reporting cycle for the Secretary General to inform the council of climate related conflict threats. There are quite a few ideas out there already, but I think um, the European members of the council working notably with interested African members of the council like Kenya and Niger should advance that agenda um, working with the, uh, the US and, and the UK um, to get some sort of text uh, agreed in, uh, in the course of the year ahead. There are spoilers, China is skeptical, Russia is very skeptical, but I think it's possible. Secondly, COVID. Um, yes, we have resolution 2565 um, calling for vaccine ceasefires. I think we need more work on actually understanding how to implement vaccine ceasefires, both in political and medical terms, uh, in places like South Sudan. And the UN Secretariat has not really started any work on that planning. I think that countries um, such as Norway, for example, with a lot of expertise on the Horn of Africa, could actually contribute their own ideas to how vaccine ceasefires could be made to, um, uh, to work. And that that would be a positive way of showing that last month's resolution wasn't just a nice thing that was passed to show that we'd moved on um, uh, from the previous COVID battles, but is actually a real contribution um, to saving lives. On specific country files, clearly Afghanistan is your top priority. If by some miracle, the Afghan peace process um, works out well, then you will have the very difficult task of um, getting a council product confirming the outcome of the Afghan peace process, but also reconfiguring the UN presence in Kabul to um, build on uh, any peace agreement. And there's quite a lot of discussion already of expanding the UN presence in Kabul with more political advisors and so on uh, to support a peace um, agreement if that is achieved. 
Um, lastly, two horrible cases. Firstly, Syria. Um, it is patently obvious that Russia is going to try and kill off um, the current Security Council mandated mechanism for getting aid into rebel held parts of Syria this July. Um, this is tragic, um, but it is necessary for Norway, Ireland and friends like Estonia to try and rally the elected members of the council to preserve that humanitarian regime, which has, as Mark Lowcock, the head of OCHA recently noted, probably saved hundreds of thousands of lives during the course of the war. And last but not least, something that Mona referred to, which is Ethiopia and Tigray. I think we can say that the current level of instability in the Horn of Africa is going to get considerably worse um, before it gets better. Um, the UN does not have a serious collective response to what's going on in and around Ethiopia yet. It's really important that countries with a lot of experience in the region like Norway or a, a formal role like um, Estonia as the chair of the Sudan Sanctions Committee uh, focus as hard as possible on trying to resolve that conflict and promote humanitarian assistance to the areas um, that are at risk. Uh, thank you. Thanks a lot, Richard. Uh, so this was a very complete uh, to-do list I have for diplomats uh, share, share and will work on with these topics. But now let's uh, move to the fourth uh, speaker, um, Dr. Ulrika Müller. Uh, you have also done research on this topic, especially the influence of uh, elected members, and you are familiar in particular with the Swedish experience, which is also uh, quite impressive uh, in the UN Security Council. So please, uh, now over to you, Ulrika. Okay, so now you can hear me, right? Yeah, okay. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for having me. Um, I will uh, talk, um, well, small members, uh, small status members of the Security Council. Uh, what do they want, what do they expect, and what can they do? Uh, by my presentation, in some parts repeating and in other ways adding to previous speakers, um, I will uh, seek to answer these three questions. Primarily, I will rely on uh, results from a survey that we sent to all permanent representations at the UN in New York a few years ago and a summary of results from the many domestic assessments of the uh, recent Swedish experience. Um, this summary is part of the work in progress analysis we are doing on the domestic politics behind international law. And when I say we, I refer to my colleague, Professor Anne-Marie Ekengren and myself, uh, along with colleagues from Finland and Iceland and our research project on campaigns for a seat in the Security Council. Um, on results from the diplomatic survey uh, with a response rate um, uh, on 30, uh, with 32%, we have identified seven specific reasons behind the candidature decision. States want to influence, they want to take responsibility, they want to network, they want to gain status, and they might have economically oriented purposes, um, including to get something in return for financially supporting the UN. They also want to improve on diplomatic competence and they have country specific reasons, such as, for example, running at regular intervals. Um, the Nordic states have a, a turn taking order between them, uh, for example. And the most uh, frequently stated reasons are one, to influence, and two, to take responsibility. Stack one and two in the chart. Um, I think it is worth to note that exercising influence is such an important reason to a candidature in the context of the widespread view of the only marginal importance of the elected 10. And um, the opportunity to influence might be the most important for a candidate to decision. But when it comes to the expectations on the actual results from a term, the diplomats uh, rate both um, uh, status and network higher than actual influence. So they are by no means naive in this regard. Um, but now let's proceed with small states and the Nordic states. And when looking at these diplomatic expectations on the possibilities from a term in the council. Uh, wrong direction. Uh, so what do, uh, what do small states expect? Uh, we have singled out three of the just referred reasons for a candidature. We refer to these as power enhancing benefits from a term in the council. Uh, and we have studied the expectations of what a term might actually offer to influence, to network, and to gain status. Uh, we have looked at three subgroups within the Western European and others group. Um, 
big states, small states, and the Nordic states, fairly straightforward. And a note on the selected subgroups. We have departed from the uh, Western European and others group due to uh, reasons related to, well, response rates and so on. Um, uh, which means that the Baltic states are not included in the results here, but we do have the data and I have looked at it and they behave very similar to the Nordic states. It might be interesting to know. Uh, while these three groups have similar expectations on their opportunities to network during a term in the council, um, small states have lesser expectations than big states on the opportunities to exercise influence but they have higher expectations on gaining status from a term. The Nordic states, they have higher expectations than small states on the opportunities to exercise influence, and they have higher expectations than big states on gaining status from an elected seat. So to comment on these results, um, the more modest expectations by small states corresponds well with our knowledge with the relevance of state size in world politics. Uh, um, a more intriguing finding is the position of the Nordic states, I think, uh, indeed a group of small states um, with their higher expectations of influence, which is more similar to big states, um, but also expecting status rewards from the two years in the limelight as wished by the small and we might assume otherwise frequent invisible in world politics uh, states. Um, so uh, one question is if the Nordic diplomats get what they want, do they live up to their own expectation? So let's look at the Swedish experience in this regard. Um, what can small European states do? Um, with these two pictures displaying happy moments from the candidature and membership um, for Sweden, the June 2016 election day and the 2018 Security Council visit to Dag Hammarskjöld Åkra. Uh, I will actually begin by addressing the perhaps less rosy domestic dimension of the Swedish, this Swedish international experience. Um, certainly the Swedish win in, um, in 2016 broke a negative trend, uh, both of a row of failed Swedish candidatures on UN positions, uh, and of Nordic defeats in the Security Council elections, but the candidature also sparked domestic controversy. As a consequence of a rather intense domestic debate arising in the concluding part of the candidature, this Swedish campaign and term in 2017 and 18 is probably, I suggest, one of the most scrutinized and investigated in the entire history of elected membership. Uh, just to give you a glimpse, uh, various reports and assessments of the candidature or parts of the candidature have been initiated and or conducted by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and by three different, um, different parliamentary committees. The membership is also assessed by the governmental office and through two additional assessments of the requests made by the government to the state office and to the uh, Swedish Defense University as demanded on the government by the Parliamentary Committee on Foreign Affairs. So as an attempt to summarize the results of these many examinations, uh, all critical conclusions is restricted to a lack of accessibility and transparency to public and media requests by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs during the phase of active campaigning. Um, uh, no assessments detect any economic improprieties or excessive Spain spending, neither during the campaign nor the membership. Uh, and, in, um, and in the most recently, um, and a number of substantial results are identified from the membership. Uh, and in the most recently published report by Professor Shell Engelbrecht, uh, sorted in three levels, national, regional, and global. Uh, this, um, Substantial results are concluded strongest on the national level uh, due to the tremendous boost of competence for the foreign services and the improvement of the Swedish international network that the membership generates. But there are also acknowledged achievements with regard to the regional and global level. Uh, So now, as an attempt to illustrate some frequently referred to as substantial results by the Swedish membership on the regional and global level, I have sorted them on basis of scholarly departures of what the E10 can do to counter the dominance of the P5. 
a first suggestion is that the E10 needs to coordinate and work together much more systematically to stand a chance against the P5. The Swedish membership contributed to such improved coordination as one example by co-hosting an E10 meeting in South Africa, gathering outgoing and incoming electing, elected members. Sweden also invested in achieving and displaying unity between the EU members in the Council. A second suggestion is to seek to exercise influence by the use of themes or to conduct niche diplomacy. Here, for example, Sweden managed to incorporate the theme on climate and security in the regional context of, of the Chad region. Um, and the third suggestion is, as mentioned uh, previously, also take the pen, so to speak, uh, which Sweden did first with, I think, Japan and Greece, and then with Kuwait uh, on the humanitarian track on Syria. Uh, and the first suggestion, and easier said than done, is simply to be competent and skillful in exercising the, the, the membership uh, and thereby contribute to the work of the Council. Now, the Swedish membership is noted for not hesitating to make contributions by taking on a number of different responsibilities, share, share positions and so on, and for two well-prepared and implemented months as chair of the Council. Uh, so uh, the Swedish experience might qualify as one good example of how a small European state or as one of the Nordic Baltic eight um, indeed can exercise some influence and thereby also gain some status, which is in accordance with the comparatively higher expectation by the, uh, expectations by their diplomats um, on the term in the council. Um, however, if the membership reinforces the competence of the foreign service, a rather significant administrative and diplomatic resourcefulness is certainly required to begin with. So not all small states can do this. Uh, indeed, small states are overrepresented in the group of states who have never served in the council. And yet, no candidate in a contested slate can now afford to ignore the many smaller states in their efforts to gather the sufficient, sufficient number of votes. As a subgroup of small states, small European resourceful states, uh, members of the Nordic Baltic Eight might have an advantage in the sense that they can attract votes from other small states uh, who feel alignment and want as strong as possible representative in the Council. In the context of a debate on the campaign, especially the competitive races in the VEUG, as a waste of resources, uh, I think it is worth to consider how the campaigns enable small states to step up their game and begin to prepare for the tough challenge that the term in the council is for them. Indeed, I think the Swedish experience also suggests that the public debate during the candidature can lead to an even better performance during the membership. Uh, learning from, from criticism during the campaign, and that a strong campaign can bring a sense of confidence into the actual term as well. So in short, the campaign has some importance for the actual membership, I would suggest. And finally, uh, while any single successful term as an elected member is of some interest by itself, long-lasting results to the consolidation of a rule-based international order obviously requires extensive coordination between terms, as the Nordic Baltic states have opportunities to do. In the longer perspective, the strongest achievement from this particular Swedish term might be as the first in a long period of much more frequent presence by the Nordic Baltic eight uh, countries in the Security Council. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ulrika, for, for this uh, very compact and uh, detailed overview. And uh, now, actually, uh, the ambassadors can only be with us for five more minutes. So I would now ask uh, uh, the two ambassadors uh, to, to reflect on, on what you said, of course, also what uh, Richard said. And uh, in particular, I want to uh, address to you a kind of as a concluding question, this question. So what, um, what then after, uh, after the elected membership? I mean, you have the two years of uh, fame when uh, the P5 uh, need to talk to you and uh, you are around tables where uh, usually uh, small states uh, don't have uh, access. But uh, 
what uh, do you do with this experience afterwards and how to make use of it uh, in a longer time frame? Uh, I think this also then is related to the question of how uh, different elected uh, members kind of uh, carry on the work uh, started by others so that uh, what one country has done in two years is not just uh, dropped uh, after that uh, period. So there are many aspects to, to this question. But uh, now, now I will give uh, the floor. Let's start with uh, Mona this time for your final remarks and any reflections on, on the other speakers and on this final question that I posed. Please, Mona. Yes, thank you, and 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 thanks for uh, valuable uh, insights also from uh, from from Richards and uh, and Ulrika. Absolutely, very very useful, and I think we can uh, can uh, align ourselves to, uh, to 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 all what what have been uh, uh, been said also also from there. Um, uh, on 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 what we will sort of uh, uh, bring uh, bring with us after we after we uh, we, we leave the council, I, I think that is uh, <laughs> that is that is quite a lot, and and and, and the fact that both that the fact that we have this kind especially among the nordics then that we are we are not talking about a, a nordic rotation for seats in the council but 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 we coordinate among ourselves so we make sure that there are nordic countries for uh, for two years then two years without and then another nordic countries and 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 like uh, like ulrika mentioned we have had a few un unfortunate uh, <laughs> uh candidatures uh, not and uh, not to being able to uh, uh to 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 win the seat now that is broken like you said and i i think uh, as long as we can continue with that i i i'm i'm very much convinced that we will be able to draw on and follow up on on both initiatives priorities from uh, from from our our, our previous uh, Nordic colleagues and I think uh, as like-minded as we are also with the uh, with the Baltic states I I, I think that is uh, that that is an uh, it, it 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 goes without saying that we will be able uh, um, to do so I mean. Uh, I mean, with, with with Sweden, for instance, now uh, both, as I say, initially, I mean, both during the campaign, in the preparation. I mean, we we looked at we. I think we have adopted more or less the same system as as Sweden had uh, when when being on the council. The distribution. Of, of, of work, how we have been organized with the meetings and things, and on 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 the different issues. I mean, we we have taken and learned so much from uh, from uh, from our from our previous um, uh, council uh, member colleagues, and 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 will continue to, uh, to 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 do that. Of course, also. When it comes to our interaction with uh, with uh, with the P5, the other countries, I think for 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 small countries, of course, it will uh, we get of course a lot more attention when we are on on the council uh, from from the big power. But I think a lot of that we can also take with us uh, when when uh, when we leave um, because uh, two year on on a council. Being as uh, as ambitious as 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 both as Estonia and, and, and Norway are, I think we have sort of made a made made, made an impression and a mark on 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 most of the big powers that uh, that what we bring to the table, being it on on uh, on, on 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 peace and, and peace uh, peace efforts, uh, being that we can actually. Be kind of bridge builders uh, in in our work, and the fact that we are getting more of the of the different pens, uh, and we can really deliver. I think that that is something that I think also the uh, the, the 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 P five will uh, will make a notice of, and that we can uh, can can bring with us. So, I um I'm 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 pretty I'm as I said that. And, and like others have said here, I, I think it's, uh, I mean, so far, at least for, for, for Norway, for the two, 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 two three first months, uh, I think we have the experience that, uh, 
that is 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 more sort of not only positive but 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 constructive in the sense that uh, we are more convinced than ever that that being on the council uh, because that is the question we have got as well in the Norwegian debate why should not we be on the council well there is we have very little influence there's so much rivalry that we can can do nothing about but but I think we uh, we I think I hope at least after those two years that we can uh, that we can prove that we have achieved something uh, on the different files and I, I agree with with uh, with riches uh, that we need to prioritize what we really will invest our our, our energy in and I, I I think those issues I think we can uh, will be able to prove that at least there have been uh, if not uh, huge changes but we have made a difference thank you thank you very much uh, Sven over to you uh, thank you Christy and just to respond quickly to something that I heard here today and and responding to your question on on what what shall we do day after well one thing that we've learned and then listening here also in all the kind, kind of different conflicts and subjects that we see one frustrating thing that we've learned being in the council is that the structure of the council but not even so much the structure of the council but I, I would say the the situation in in, in geopol the geopolitical situation in the world brings us to a situation where simple things even are really complicated you know the, when you look at the adoption of products then some of them when you think about the subject then we, if you think about the, the situation in the conflict and so on it should be a no-brainer and should be easy and especially when we are not talking only about resolutions or prsts but even or, or even press statements we have failed to adopt press elements, the simplest of things, you know. And, and first of all, there are always 15 and somebody of them will come up with some, some uh, uh, amendments that are hard to, uh, to, to accept by others. But then there is also vested interest and especially by big ones. And what Richard mentioned, you know, the, the China-Russia push actually that is, is visible everywhere. Um, and, and one thing we have to learn from that is in order to be able to get to a product and this is what we did and we learned also together in norway on on working on this uh, this uh, press statement on targeted killings in afghanistan it took a long time to get there but but you need perseverance you need uh, you need never to, to 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 lose hope you know there are moments when you see that okay nothing's happening it's dead let's continue the same happened with the COVID resolution last year you know there were several moments when it was completely gone and then finally uh, early July we managed to adopt it so keep working on it Myanmar is a good example you know China has a vested interest China is is, is a spiel a, 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 a problem in that uh, but at the same time we've managed to have two AOVs we've managed to have two PRSTs uh, and small countries were very big part in it you know in pushing for that even though it's it's uk uh, pen holdership in that but i think in order for this to happen there has been a very strong push also from the the the, the elected countries another thing that we we've learned now and i can clearly tell the new countries who are coming to me to ask questions is what is really crucial is to have a good legal team and and who, who know the procedures and and also to have a very good team both here in new york but also in the capital and the cooperation between the two and this is again something where i'm really as ambassador i'm, I'm so happy to see that that the both teams are absolutely fabulous and the the cooperation with Tallinn is so seamless and and so good both on institutional level and personal level and so on and this is crucial for success and the legal team you know i remember uh, the two moments when I was so happy, and, and it's, it's a kind of a rewarding moment when, when a first-time member and a new member of the council coming from a tiny country wins a debate to the, with a major P5 on procedural matters. And, and it happened twice, you know, a case during our presidency. Our presidency was at a really difficult start, the first day of uh, adopting the program of work when, uh, when there was a conflict between Russia and and the West on, on briefer on, on Syria chemical weapons. And it ended uh, the very last day, and it was even a Saturday, actually, when it happened, when, 
when uh, UK and others like-minded, they wanted to raise any other business on Hong Kong. And I remember I was two o'clock in the morning on the phone with the Chinese ambassador and, and how it all worked out. And, and, and I'm glad to say that our team was just so good being a, a, a new member uh, and, and, and a, a small country. Uh, Richard mentioned also the, the pluses and minuses of video. Yes, and the VTCs, uh, they, we, we, we managed to also put to our service the strong points that we, or the, the strengths that Estonia has, and that's the digital issues. And, and we've become famous, and I, I'm proud, you know, when we had the first on the 8th of May last year, when we had the, an, a, an ARIA format meeting on, on, on uh, the end of the Second World War, and even the Russian ambassador texted me saying that you should take over all the, the UN video conferences. So this is this is something what what there are pluses like this event today for example it wouldn't have happened if we we wouldn't be on, on video but at the same time I'm also absolutely certain that this three and a half months that we worked on the COVID resolution last year it wouldn't have been so long if we would have been able to talk to each other in in person so this part of diplomacy is missing the U.S. China rivalry is here to stay you know it will change probably the tone will change and so on from from uh, from tr Trump times, but this is here to stay, and this this uh, it will not be a harmonious uh, world that we will we will live in with with the change of administration. And then finally, on the on the on the after, you know, it's when we started the campaign, we we learned mostly from Sweden because it was the first time for us, and we asked questions about the campaign, about the teams, and about the subjects and everything. And one important thing that, that we heard from Sweden and what we tried to do was enter the campaign with a win-win in mind so that either you win the election, but even if you don't win the election, you win new relationships and, and you bring them along. And, and this is exactly what happened. So when we talk about the situation where Estonia is right now, having, having the special relationship with P5, but at the same time, we have special relationship with the world. You know, African countries are approaching us. We are visible to everybody. And this is something where that we can bring along also after the council. And we have also tried to find special points during the campaign also to get into the council that would be sort of holding us in the relationship even when it's over, that we didn't only visit this island state somewhere or, or small African country, but there will be something that will anchor us into the relationship. And one thing that we learned was that where Estonia is strong and we are, we are working on its e-governance, for example, when, where this, this cooperation would continue. But definitely the relationships that we have gained from, from, uh, from the membership, both P5 but also with the world, it's not easy, but we will try to keep them also for the future. And, and the knowledge that we have learned either on the situation in the world, but also the experience for our diplomats. This is something that will remain. I think there will be a huge number of diplomats who will be just much more professional than we were two years ago. That is another thing that is, is good for a small country. Thank you. And now we have to leave because we, we have a meeting starting. Yes, yes, I know. Uh, thank you to both ambassadors, uh, Mona Yul and Sven Jürgensen for finding the time in your busy schedule and uh, good luck with uh, working further on, on your priorities. Um, I know you have to leave for the meeting now, but uh, let's continue the discussion with, uh, with uh, Richard and uh, Ulrika. Um, well, uh, Richard, uh, you started uh, with the point uh, that uh, um, the problems at uh, Security Council are overestimated and uh, Security Council is not actually paralyzed, although there are uh, the tensions, uh, especially between uh, big powers. And of course, there never was a perfect uh, time for multilateralism anyway. There were always, always tensions between countries. Uh, but what is your view on, on um, why do we hear it so so often nowadays that uh, the UN Security Council is is paralyzed and how how to change that uh, perception? Do people have too high expectations and uh, then um, then they are disappointed because the actual um, actual uh, results of uh, the Security Council work are are so poor or, or 
how do you explain this and what to do about it? Richard. Um, so I, I would answer that by saying that I think you can, you can divide the issues on the council agenda into roughly three groups. And the first group tragically is the Syria type um, conflicts and you know Syria is the overarching uh, catastrophe for the council of the last decade where you have first order geopolitical rifts that really do mean the council uh, is not paralyzed but does not deliver um, anything equal to the challenge and I think that um, for audiences in Europe and especially I think probably Eastern Europe um, you can, can add to that Ukraine, Belarus, uh, cases where you know, Russia's interests mean that the council can at most talk. And you know, Poland, uh, Estonia's predecessor um, as the Eastern European member of the council, I think was very frustrated because it really wanted to try and get something done on Ukraine during its two years in New York. It found very quickly that it couldn't. And I think that was also a, you know, a problem for selling its term domestically. The second group um, of crises where we don't see paralysis, um, although we often see smaller problems, is around peacekeeping and around sort of long running uh, UN mediation processes um, in places like the Congo or South Sudan, where, you know, despite occasional tensions, actually um, the P5 and the E10 uh, do work fairly constructively most of the time. And you know, that is actually a very big share of the council's agenda. Um, and you know, that's, you know, that's where productive stuff still gets done. It tends to be in crises below the first level of geopolitical tension. Um, finally, something we've seen recently, which I'm thinking about a lot, where there's a lot of frustration is a third category of crises like Ethiopia or like Nagorno-Karabakh, which, um, as we've all said, sort of unexpectedly thrust themselves onto the council agenda. They're not quite as divisive as Syria, um, but the council just cannot find a substantive response in time. And I think that, um, you know, I, I actually think that the council's weakest performance in recent months has been around a lot of those crises um, where there's been talk, but no action. Um, but I would emphasize that, you know, the middle set, the sort of classic peacekeeping, as it were, there is still a lot of work, but it just doesn't get the same attention as Syria. Thank you. Um, now, I also want to uh, put one question to Ulrika. We don't have too much uh, time left, but uh, that's also a rather big question. Uh, you, you spoke about uh, status, which is a rather fluid uh, concept. Uh, as you say, small states uh, expect to gain in their international status by, by joining the Security Council. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about um, how, how do you study it? What do you mean by it? Uh, do you look into it in, in some specific uh, ways, how to measure this uh, or assess this uh, status thing, Ulrika? Okay, thank you. Yeah, we, we're actually very straightforward in this sense. We, we have asked the, the ambassadors uh, or the diplomats and they have uh, responded fairly um, uh, um, open about it, uh, that it, it is at stake. Uh, one one uh, interesting finding, I think, is that they tend to ascribe status ambitions more to other states candidatures than to themselves. They, they, they tend to describe that they uh, run for, for the council for, because they want to, to make a contribution, uh, but they ascribe status ambitions to, to, uh, to, uh, to other states. And the, and the classic interpretation of that in, in, in survey uh, research is to actually ascribe, to, to suspect that there are status considerations also to, to the respondents to the, to the survey. So status is at stake here, but, but they are not secret about it. They might just only 
overestimate uh, the importance it has to others. And but two things also on status, it, it might actually work as a glue uh, in, in in diplomacy that you actually because you, by status you're getting a certain reputation, getting some prestige for being successful in a certain topic, that might actually improve uh, your diplomatic. Um, uh, missions in, in other ways other ways and the other the other way is that it just brings some short-term luster to a, to a state after after a term in the council and it will easily disappear but i think the um uh, it was uh, very well described here previously that that that's actually an, a work that that states have to do after the membership they have to entertain and cultivate the networks that they have uh, um, uh, gathered during the membership and they have to also uh, work on their own visibility, so to speak, in, in, in uh, UN politics also after the membership. But that is difficult because it's especially for small states. So, yeah. You are muted. Yes, thank you. Um, Richard and Ulrika, if you have time for uh, one more final question, we can uh, carry on uh, for, for a bit more. Um, and and uh, I would like to take uh, a question that uh, just uh, was posed from the audience, uh, which is also an interesting one that we didn't discuss yet. And that concerns uh, the inclusion of uh, non-state actors. Uh, there is this concept of uh, networked diplomacy, networked multilateralism. Uh, is this something that uh, you see as important also for the Security Council? Um, and uh, can the E10 elected members uh, have a special role to play? Richard. Yes, absolutely. And actually I would um, connect that to uh, another question um, that was posed by uh, an audience member, um, uh, Lou, Lou Coatney, which is, can elected members be the conscience of the council? And I think, uh, I think elected members can play a significant role um, in terms of public outreach using formats like the ARIA formula. The, the now ARIA formulas, as most people on this call know, are informal sessions of the council involving civil society briefers. And on issues like Ukraine um, or more recently Belarus, uh, where for obvious reasons, the chances of council action are, are nil or close to nil. I still think there is an important um, service in holding RA formula meetings, drawing attention to voices of civil society from places like Donbass or, or, or Belarus, um, you know, the council, you know, we, we judge the council most of the time in terms of its, its products and its resolutions and its vetoes. Um, we forget the fact that the council is also, it has a, still has a certain prestige in global affairs and it still a, a, attracts a certain level of attention in global affairs that it probably doesn't deserve most of the time. But you can use that to sort of amplify the voices of, um, NGOs or groups like the, the, you know, well, I would say the Belarusian government, but I mean, um, Belarusian opposition. Um, and I think Estonia has actually done that quite smartly on, on a number of occasions. Um, so that is worthwhile. And I think that does add up to being the conscience of the council as well. Thank you. Ulrika. Yes, thank you. Well, the degree to which I can add something to what Richard just uh, said, I would I would base it on the Swedish experience, and that was, um, well, it it was a, a strong part of the the Swedish membership that they actually had very extensive uh, civil society consultations uh, before and during the the membership, um, and also that they made uh, an effort out of uh, in terms of the women, peace, and security. Uh, theme or agenda that they really strive towards um, uh, gender equality when it came to the to the to the brief, the people who were briefing the the council. So significantly adding the number of women uh, that that actually did those uh, briefings, which is actually one way you, where you can collaborate with with civil society on on the specific themes that you want to to kind of uh, move forward in the council. 
Thank you. Uh, I'm afraid our time is over. Uh, there would be more questions both from the audience and myself, but uh, luckily this is not uh, the last time we will be discussing uh, the topic. Uh, we have to finish for today, but uh, the project uh, of the Estonian Foreign Policy Institute and the Norwegian uh, Foreign Affairs Institute uh, will uh, continue. Uh, there will be more events and also some uh, publications, uh, so I hope you will all uh, continue to, to follow us and uh, have these uh, discussions on, on the UN Security Council and uh, multilateralism and elected uh, members in particular. But now it is uh, time to thank very much our excellent uh, speakers and uh, thank you also to the audience. And uh, thank you once again to, to the partners and supporters who have uh, made uh, this event uh, possible. This, webinar is now closed. Thank you. Thank you very much.